Hello once again. My name is Peter Woodbury with Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. Today we have the honor of interviewing Mr. Stephen Schwartz. He's a distinguished faculty member at Saybrook University. He's also a fellow at the William James Center. He's a columnist for the Explore magazine, editor of his own Schwartz Report. He's an author of several books best known for Eight Laws of Change, also The Vision, a novel of time and consciousness. He has over 40 years of experience studying remote viewing, archaeology, medicine, and healing. So let's uh, proceed and hear from Mr. Stephen Schwartz. So hi, Stephen. How are you today? I'm doing very well. A pleasure. Uh, glad to join you. Thanks for uh, joining us. It's been a while since I've seen you. How have you been? Uh, you know, pretty productive, busy, just about to bring out a new novel, The Amish Girl, which will be out on the 10th of April, and, and um, continuing to do research, doing a big remote viewing project. Oh, so, so you've uh, gotten into writing novels. Is this your second? This is the third. Third, oh, okay. The first was Awakening, and then the second was The Vision, and the third, which is about to come out, is The Amish Girl. Oh. Yeah. I I um I was the keynote speaker at a conference about, oh, about two years ago, and um, yeah, 2016, and um, three years ago, uh, and I a group of of people at the conference, millennials, and Gen Xers asked me to go out to lunch. They wanted to ask me a bunch of questions. And I made a reference to something, uh, Barbara Tuckman, uh, one of the great woman histo women historians of the 20th century, and they'd never heard of her. And mm. then I mentioned David McCullough, and they didn't know him either. Mm. So I said to them, what is it you read? And they said, well, we read novels, adult comic books. We watch uh, video uh, on Netflix and stars and things like that. And... Um, we play video games. So I went home and said, well, I don't know anything about video games and uh, I'm not doing television anymore, but uh, I can write novels. So I don't know anything about adult comic books. So I will write novels. So I started writing novels. The first one was Awakening, a novel of aliens and consciousness. And um, I found out I really liked it. It's I have a good time writing novels. Oh, I see, because um, we'd been wondering with your strong background in research, what had got you into novel writing? And so the, the motivation was re really to reach the, the new generation? Yeah, I realized I could put the same stuff I put into all my science papers into a novel, uh, and it was actually easier because I didn't have to put a footnote at the end of every sentence, and I didn't have to check three times to make sure everything was exactly correct. And, and as a result, uh, I could just make a narrative story. And then I discovered even more, and all of the novels have this, is that I would just tell stories out of my life uh, and novelize them. Oh. So everything is, I mean, the characters are different, of course, and the names are different, but basically all of the stories in the novels are things that I have actually done or lived through or whatever. And so it's quite easy for me to do it, and I've, it's fun. Yeah, so it sounds like you can, uh, it's both creative and playful. Yeah, yeah, and they seem to be well-liked, and they, the, the first ones won uh, a uh, literary award, and uh, then uh, the, the second one is up for a literary award, so people seem to like them, and that, that's great. Oh, that is great, that is great. Well, let's, uh, let's backtrack a little bit, and. Um, let, uh, let's find out about how you got involved with Edgar Cayce. What was, where was that uh, spark lit for you? I don't know if any of your viewers have been in this space, but I just mm -hmm. was at a place where I just didn't know what to do. I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. I had been successful at what I had done. I checked off all the appropriate boxes, I thought, and but somehow it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was just there was something shallow about it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I drove down to Virginia Beach and and um, was taken up to the ARE, the Edgar Casey Foundation headquarters, 
And I went in with this young woman who was showing me around and she said, well, these are the readings. And I didn't know what a reading was. And so I, you know, she explained to me her understanding of that. Mm. And there were all these uh, loose leaf notebooks like you'd have in school, these green notebooks. Mm -hmm. And there were hundreds of them. And she said, well, these are all the readings. There's about 15,000 readings. And at random, I pulled one down and opened it up and it was a reading I would today would call it a remote viewing session but mm -hmm. in any case mm -hmm. it was a reading and it was for it was given in 1936 and it said uh, for a woman and it said that she had been in an earlier incarnation she had been a teacher of astrology at uh, the Essene community at what I immediately recognized at Kerbet Qumran mm -hmm. And my, it's hard to explain, but my hair stood on end because mm. the last thing I had done for Geographic before I'd gotten drafted was research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I was pretty aware of what was known about it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that in 1936, nobody knew that Kerbet Qumran was an Essene community. And no one knew that women were involved with the Essene community. And no one knew they had an interest in astrology. Mm -hmm. All of that turns out to be true mm -hmm. because in 1947, a young Bedouin tribes boy was chucking a rock into a cave while, while he was shepherding his family's animals and mm -hmm. he discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And the scrolls themselves talk about their fascination with astrology and excavation at the site revealed female skeletons. And so everything that we learned after 1947 prove that Casey had been right in 1936, but where did he get that information? So I thought to myself, wh where did he get this? How did he access it? And what is that telling us about human consciousness? So you had a tremendous amount of synchronicity. Uh, uh, yes, synchronistic is exactly the right word. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it was very bizarre. I mean, this set of experiences. In any case, so I started reading. I decided if I was going to uh, I wanted to know about this and who Edgar Casey was. I had no idea. And so I decided that I would start reading his readings and that because I'm a very methodical kind of person, I decided I would start at the first reading and read them all. And it took me a number of years to do it. And I, in those days, this was a long time ago, 1964, uh, Gladys Davis, was uh, Turner was still alive and she was the archivist who had yes. assembled. Uh, I mean, I learned a great deal from her about how you keep records. Yeah. She was a very, very meticulous documenter of everything about Casey. So there was not just uh, his statements, but there were all this correspondence, transcriptions of telephone conversations, I mean, everything down to restaurant receipts when they'd gone out to eat. It, it, she was really wow. amazing. Wow. And as I read these things, I my entire view about what humanity was about and what it was, what human consciousness was about, because I'd been a kind of a materialist, you know, dead meat, no consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, that this was an entirely different way of looking at the world. And after two or three years, I began, I decided I needed to know what science thought about all this. So I started reading the parapsychological journals. And I also read, you know, Steiner, Blavatsky, Uspensky, Gurdjieff, yeah. all the, all of the sort of metaphysical stuff. And did you feel that in that period, your, your depression lifted, that you found something that yes. gave you purpose yeah, I, and meaning? Exactly. Yeah. I realized this was really fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. And so in 1968, I began to experiment with what I then called distant viewing um, and was and did began doing experiments. Mm -hmm. And I got interested also because I had uh, studied anthropology. I began I, I, thinking about, well, what would be a really ideal kind of experimental uh, protocol? And at that time, archaeology, there was a big, in, in archaeology, there was a big discussion going on about how archaeological sites got, dis got discovered. Mm -hmm. And mostly they were discovered from a sort of serendipitous events 
a farmer would be plowing a field and discover a temple or road builders would be building a road and would discover a tomb, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is perfect. I can do these, what I called, as I said, distant viewing today, we'd call it remote viewing. Mm -hmm. I can do these experiments uh, in archeology span uh, because they offer absolutely clear triple blind conditions. That is, everybody knows that the thing exists, but everybody also agrees and knows that they don't know where it is. So mm -hmm. if I could find it using uh, non-local consciousness, then there was an unimpeachable, uh, and do it with an unimpeachable chronology. Mm -hmm. That is, I would take, I would get, I collect the data and get all the information, and then I would have it notarized and turn it over to a third party. So there was an unimpeachable chronology. Mm -hmm. People couldn't say, "Oh well, you just made that up after you, you know, you just stumbled over it and mm. and um, and you made up all this stuff after the fact." So, in order to eliminate all those kinds of criticisms, I uh, had everything notarized and turned over to a third party, and then I did a series of healing experiments, in which it became clear that healing is also not an energy phenomena. You're not sending healing. What's happening is what Max Planck said in his interview in 1931. And 1931, Max Planck was asked, he was then, he and Einstein were the most famous scientists in the world. He was the father of quantum mechanics. And they asked Max Planck, you know, what have you learned? You've been doing this research all this time. What have you learned? And Max Planck said, what I've learned is that consciousness is causal and fundamental. You cannot get behind consciousness space-time arises from consciousness, not consciousness from space-time. Consciousness is the fundamental. Mm. So, so consciousness exists outside of space-time. Consciousness, space-time is in fact a fabrication of consciousness manipulating mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And that really is the big insight that I have learned over the 50 years of doing research is that what we're dealing with is an aspect of consciousness that is eternal, what religion calls the soul, and uh, it episodically manifests a personality that incarnates, but the consciousness exists prior to incarnation and continues mm. after corporeal death, after physical death, that there is an aspect of us that is not limited by space-time, we know from remote viewing that it's possible to describe something that is close. It's just as easy to describe something that is very far away, even on another planet. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's possible to describe something that is in the present as it is as easy as doing something that is in the deep past, in, in this, like Cleopatra's Palace or Lighthouse of Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that I found. Um, that when you are describing the future, what you are describing is a probability, mm -hmm. the highest probability that something will occur at the moment that you are answering the question, but it's not predestined, it's not fixed. Mm -hmm. And that all of this is a result of consciousness manipulating information. So the big mystery question for me, I don't have an answer and I don't know anybody that does, is what is information? That's, uh, that's not a trivial question mm -hmm. because clearly information exists outside of space and time. So what is it? I don't know. Now just to, to related as you're talking and getting a lot of thoughts, you know, Edgar Cayce talked about how all time is one time and that here on this earth we experience time separated by the present moment, the past and the future. And so he had had a dream where he dreamed about a future existence living on the coast of Nebraska. And yes. that's where that theme came up. And so, so is, do you think that, that somehow this moment where we're speaking with each other, this is an actual moment, but there is some, some way that the future exists as a probability and the past is somehow a realized potential? 
Is that some, as we try to conceptualize that in a three-dimensional mind? I learned from the, again, from the Casey material was his views of the future. Mm -hmm. And his idea that the future is not fixed, it's de you're dealing with probabilities, that turns out to be correct. And so after I had been doing experiments for probably 20 years, four times in my life I've been involved with changing history. Mm -hmm. And I've paid very close attention to how it happened. And I began to look at how does non-local consciousness, which we normally think of as a single person activity, how does that expression play out as a social phenomenon? And, and that led me to what, how do people create trends and how do those trends shape our future? So the Schwartz Report, which is schwartzreport.net, mm -hmm. uh, I publish every day, I give it away. Uh, the Schwartz Report is about following trends that are shaping the future. Mm -hmm. And particularly beginning in 1991, when I first became aware of climate change, I have focused on things like climate change and sea rise, mm -hmm. also changes in energy production, healthcare changes. So I follow major trends which are shaping the future. Mm -hmm. We are at a crossroads and the next few years are going to tell how it's going to happen. Well, Stephen, it's been a pleasure talking with you. We're going to have to wrap up soon, but is there anything you'd like to finish with? Any closing thoughts you have to share with us and our viewers? Yes. The, let me share you with this, this final thought. If you want to create social change which fosters well-being, this is how you do it. Every day you make hundreds of decisions. You go to the store, you buy toothpaste, you buy dishwater detergent, you buy fertilizer, you buy toilet paper, you buy all those things that you buy. Every day you make hundreds of decisions. You need to become first aware, first of all, that you are making decisions and that these are votes. Second of all, you need to consistently always choose of the options that are available to you the one that is the most compassionate, life-affirming, and fostering of well-being. You should tell 10 people that you're doing this as a discipline, invite them to join you, and tell 10 of their friends. Mm -hmm.